Okay. Good morning. Here we are. Another week. And a uh, beautiful, beautiful day. Yes. I can't remember a May being so consistently warm and cool mornings and and very warm afternoons and wow. I think you're just um, losing your capacity to remember things. <laughs> Could well be. <laughs> That's been coming for a while. I can remember some quite a few days like Sing him 535. Oh, somebody didn't say that yet? No, I didn't. Somebody was calling me. <laughs> um, okay. 535, how wide the love of Christ. How wide the love of Christ. It knows not class or race, but holds our run humanity within. Until this broken world is found in everlasting peace. How high the love of Christ, beyond all thought it soars, and yet upon our passing lives unmeasured mercy pours. How deep the love of Christ. Descending to a cross, he bears within his wounded hands all human pain and loss. All praise to you, O Christ, for love whose depth and height, whose strength and length and breadth in time and space, with endless life and light. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy, on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment, do you think, will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sacrificed and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. 
Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. This week we get to get into chapter 11, which is a really special chapter. But they, these verses are a marvelous invitation. Uh, therefore, brothers, he continues to draw us along. Uh, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. That, imagine, that's a, that's a very big statement. Because of the blood of Jesus, we have confidence to, to go in where nobody could go in. Where, where uh, uh, you know, it sounds like a Star Trek intro. But no, where no one could go in except the priests into the holy place and the high priest in the most holy place. We have confidence to go into these holy places because of the blood of Christ. Since that, then let us draw near with a true heart. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. This is a description of the Christian life. Uh, to draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water, we can draw near to God. Uh, and so, well, Sunday's the only morning I get to golf. Or it's the only time I have with my family. Or, wait a minute, you have, you, because of Jesus' blood, get to enter the holy places and to draw near to God with a clean conscience. You've been washed, and so you're going to go do something else. <laughs> I, it boggles the mind. Uh, the woman in Luke chapter 8 who, who is afraid, but nevertheless, who approaches Jesus. She has this issue of blood. She's unclean. And and she shouldn't dare to touch anyone, much less this, this wonderful teacher. But she knows if she can just touch the edge of his garment, and she's healed. Uh, this woman who's, who's used to trying to avoid touching anyone, Lest, lest she offend them. She, she is brave to draw near to Jesus. Let us draw near with a true heart. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. And, and we are so easily brought to doubt. Oh, well, well, what if this? What if that? But because we, are, we can enter the most holy places because of Jesus' blood... Why would we ever doubt or worry? Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And this is... Uh, I talked to a pastor the other day about... Um, not my own pastor, about um, the pastor's conference. And, uh, and he said, well, you know, he... He had a very valid family reason for not being able to go. But um, he said, you know, that he never really looks at the speakers, but it's the conversations with other pastors that are so valuable. And I said, not only that, but they are valuable. Your conversation with them is valuable to them. And so when we're not there, the conversation we could have had that would have been an opportunity to encourage a brother in Christ doesn't happen. So it's it's not only, uh, oh, I don't feel like it today, or, you know, um, I'm not getting much out of whatever it is at church. Others are encouraged by your presence. Just as church is always so encouraging on Christmas and Easter when it's wall-to-wall -wall people. Just that fact makes it so uh, exciting. Um, and and there are others there, then you are surrounded by brothers and sisters in Christ. You are a part of that, making that happen. 
Then he has this difficult paragraph. If we go on sinning deliberately, that that is, when a person acknowledges, they they understand what Jesus did for them, and they want their sins forgiven, but not this one over here. This one sin I want to keep there. I want to keep doing that. I'm going to live in that. Uh, I've often been challenged uh, that the church is, church is uh, only worried about sex. And there's all these other sins. But very often with sexuality, these are, these are situations that we, that we get ourselves into. And it's not just an episodic, I sinned but rather an embracing of an ongoing life of rejecting God's will and knowing that we are, but saying, well, other people sin too. But not understanding. I'm, I'm intentionally, deliberately pushing off the forgiveness of Christ. So he warns against this. Uh, but recall the former days after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. Sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction. Sometimes being partners with those so treated. He's saying, don't lose what you had. Look, when you began in faith, you, you went through all kinds of trials and difficulties. He says, uh, you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew your, that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. And we cannot take that. They're one of the big fears these days is that what if the government, which is a very valid possibility, what if the government decides, the nation decides, that that uh, charitable donations or donations to a church are no longer tax deductible? Oh, woe is me. Oh, my goodness. Oh, we would lose our tax deduction on our donations. And then, of course, donations would fall because because God's not giving us as much, right? I, the believers in the first century were being robbed and their possessions taken. And yet, because they were in faith, because through the blood of Christ they could enter the most holy places, they rejoiced to have been plundered. They understood they had greater possessions than that. Where we tend to be very focused on all the nice possessions which we have, which are very, very much nicer than anything that they had. What if I, what if I don't get to get the boat that I wanted? Uh, what if I can no longer afford the second place, the second home? Um, those things happen. What if I can't buy a new pair of jeans? Yes. I mean, I don't want to make it sound... Well, it doesn't have to be just the great, big, huge, rich things. No, that's right. What if I still have to wear this instead of something new? Yeah. And I'm tired of wearing this same article of clothing, and I wanted to replace it. And I think most of us, most of the people of the generation watching these videos, remembers a time when you had only a few sets of clothing. You had your school clothes that you took off right after school, and you had your play clothes, and you had your church clothes. And you didn't have, like, when you go to sending a kid to school, this is a shocker to us. You've got to have, like, five pairs of shoes for them. Well, there's a pair of shoes they can only wear indoors. Uh, and then there's a pair of shoes they can only wear in the gymnasium. And then there's the outdoor shoes. And then they have to have boots, and because we're in Michigan. And, oh my gosh. Um, we are so richly blessed. And the author of Hebrews says, you, this, you once had an, a, a right way of thinking about this, and you, you were mistreated and so on, and yet you knew that you had this heavenly gift. That you could enter the most holy places, that you had a treasure in heaven. Therefore, don't throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. That is, to remain in faith, to be encouraged and to encourage one another, and not to shrink back, but to endure to the end. Then he'll give us examples of 
endurance to the end as we go on into chapter 11 tomorrow. An exciting chapter. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus. We talked a lot about the challenges of faith, but this chapter began with the most wonderful and encouraging words. Thank you, Lord, that because you shed your blood for us and over us, that we can enter the throne room of God as we come in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, we come to you, Heavenly Father, standing in your presence, unafraid, because we have been washed clean. Bless us today that with all the beauty and wonder of the gifts you've given us, that we would see this as the greatest, greatest gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Have a good day. Yep.